You should. Everyone should have the banner now. <clears throat> yep. It is. We're being recorded. So, morning, everybody. Morning. Good morning. I want to welcome you all to our um, BCA Workforce Council meeting. And uh, I'm obligated to say that uh, the governor's executive order regarding public meetings is still in place. So this meeting is being recorded, uh, as we just noted, and it'll be posted on our website um, after the meeting. Melissa, you're giving me a strange face. Is there a problem? No, um, I'm trying to get the transcribing to go off the side of my computer. It has nothing to do with you. <clears throat> OK, well, I'm very um, excited that we have four new members to the council. Uh, it's a it's a banner meeting. Uh, many of you met Adam Prizio before because uh, he attended a labor management committee meeting. But Adam, I think this is your first official council meeting and I I is that correct? I think so. I believe so. And Eileen Healy and, and Peg Szymanski and Fran Mazzarella, who uh, I don't think is going to be joining us today. And we have one other uh, council member pending with Representative Candelora's office that hopefully will come through uh, shortly. Uh, it's a recommendation of Mary Caruso. So um, before we go on, maybe let's just go around and, and we can start with the, the new members and just introduce yourself. Adam, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Adam Prizio. Um, I am currently a staff attorney at the Connecticut State Office of the Healthcare Advocate, which for those of you who may not know, is a um, state agency that provides free uh, advice assistance um, with uh, for all Connecticut residents with their health insurance and to some extent health care needs. Um, prior to this work, I worked for an independent living center in uh, upstate New York as the um, as an in-house lobbyist. And um, so I'm I did a lot of work on what we called self-direction and what I believe Connecticut calls consumer employment, which I'm still I'm still transitioning my language over. Um, uh, a lot of work around wage and workforce issues, and I am very happy to be um, carrying that work forward here. Thanks. <clears throat> Eileen, you want to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Eileen Healy. I'm the executive director of Independence Northwest in Naugatuck, which is one of the five independent living centers in the state. Um, I've been involved in a number of issues. I've been in my job 33 years um, and still love it. All right, well, welcome. Thank you. Peg, you want to introduce yourself? Sure, um, Peg Szymanski, I am retired and uh, worked for 38 and a half years with Eversource and um, finished my career in IT working to support systems for the electric operations division. Um, I have uh, two boys, uh, one of whom just got married in September and the other of whom is living with us at home and he's working now through the Mark organization out of Middletown. Um, we, uh, we utilized um, Sunset Shores uh, capabilities to hire uh, an individual to work with our son for about three years. And it was just a great opportunity to blend both having um, Ben have a mentor and also be part of um, an agency out of Chester called uh, Adult Vocational Programs. So uh, I'm here and I'm hoping to help in whatever way that I can. And uh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, great to have you on board. Kathy, you want to introduce yourself? 
Kathy Flaherty. I'm the executive director of Connecticut Legal Rights Project. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with CLRP, we're a statewide nonprofit that represents people who are eligible for mental health services from the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services uh, to protect their civil legal rights with regard to treatment, recovery, housing, um, things like that. And I'm a governor's appointee on behalf of consumers with disabilities. Thanks, Kathy. Dawn, you want to introduce yourself? Sure, morning. My name is Dawn Lambert. I co-lead the Community Options Unit at the Department of uh, Social Services. I work in the Division of Health Services. It's nice to see everybody. And Denise? Yes, um, Denise Palladino. I work for um, the Department of Developmental Services. I'm the self-determination director. So I oversee the case managers and brokers for individuals and families who self-direct their services. I also, uh, my other hat, um, I oversee the behavioral services program for our youths uh, who um, both have intellectual disabilities as well as clinical um, and behavioral issues as well. Thanks, Denise. Welcome. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, the person who keeps the council functioning, Melissa. Morning, everybody. I'm Melissa Morton. I've spoken with all of you individually now, I think. Um, I work for the Office of Policy and Management, and among my duties, I am a staff to the PCA Workforce Council. Thanks. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Does everybody have the agenda that Melissa had sent around? Yes. Okay, so moving to the next item, Melissa, if you want to give us a quick update on on membership and subcommittee assignments, now that we have all these great people, Ooh, let's put them to sure. work. Sure. Um, sure. So uh, as David reported earlier, we're doing very well um, with our membership. As I told um, some of the new members, as we were going through the onboarding process, uh, the council really um, in the last year is, is turning over, going through a rebirth. Most of the members were original appointees from when the council started in back in 2012 and had um, Kathy Flaherty is, is still hanging on. We're hoping you don't go anywhere, Kathy. No pressure. Um, but we are so glad to um, be able to have some new faces and new energy on the council. Uh, we welcome all of you. As David said, um, the, we do have one pending um, individual who will be a representative of individuals with physical disabilities um, who would be an appointee from Representative Candelora. Where we could really use help is in filling some of our other vacancies. We're having a very hard time recruiting for um, organizations that represent individuals who are um, older adults. We have gone through a slew of nominees um, that people have sent to me, and it just seems that pools that are pretty tacked out and just can't take anything else on are the area agencies on aging, the senior center directors, the access agencies. Um, you know, they've we've approached different people at different of those types of organizations and they've all had to decline due to not being able to take on any extra work. It would be great if we actually could recruit an older adult who has familiarity with utilizing the services. So um, we need two of those and we are also recruiting for um, an individual or organization representing individuals with developmental disabilities. We have one more opening in that area as well. Um, so if you have anybody, please feel free to send it over. Adam, I see your hand up. Yeah, just um, as I'm making a note, um, the, the first organizations uh, representing older adults, do you need 
is it an individual or organization or does it need to be an individual representing an organization? No, it can be it can be an individual. I mean, technically the statute says an organization representing, but we've had individuals in those roles before. And, you know, we had um, PEG is an individual representing individuals with developmental disabilities and our past members were as well. So it's totally acceptable. OK, thank you. Um, the other thing that I wanted to get to were our subcommittees. Now that we have new members, I spoke to each of the new members about which subcommittee they would be interested in joining. And so um, I am happy to report that our training and labor management subcommittees look much better now um, and will not just be Denise, Dawn, David and I and, and Kathy on the training committee. Um, so that's good news. Uh, we have Eileen has um, graciously agreed to join the training subcommittee and Peg and Adam are on the labor management uh, subcommittees. Fran is still deciding where her her heart rests, so um, she is going to give us her response, um, but she's leaning towards training, which is good. That'll even us out. The other thing I wanted to propose to the group today, and I'm sorry, everybody's facial expressions are like behind my speaking. So um, if you're trying to say something, it's just taking a minute for the visual to catch up. Um, I would like to propose to the group something we discussed a couple years ago when we had full membership and then people dropped out when we had a pandemic, so we dropped the idea. But um, the council does not currently have bylaws and we had discussed developing bylaws um, in order to help formalize our operations, particularly around membership, membership responsibility, frequency of meetings to make sure it aligns with statute, things of that nature. So I was wanted to propose to the group to see if there would be interest after the new year in starting a bylaw committee um, to begin to put together bylaws uh, for the council. I think it would be really beneficial. It would be something we could give to our new members as they onboard. Um, but I think it's important for any operating body like this to, to have a set of bylaws to guide us. I can also um, get bylaws from other Council similar to us. I believe um, I was talking to the folks in Massachusetts and they recently put together a set of bylaws for their workforce council. Uh, this, I think we spoke about this just before the pandemic, actually, um, the folks in Massachusetts and I. So if anybody's interested in the bylaw subcommittee, Kathy, I see you are, so thank you. Um, please message me and let me know. After this meeting, I'm going to send around the current list of members and subcommittee members. And if folks wanted, want to sign up for the bylaw committee or think they need to make a change in the, the committee they're signed up for, just please let me know uh, through email and we can update the subcommittee list. But we're really in the best shape that we've been in in a long time. <clears throat> right, thanks, Melissa. Anybody have any questions around that? <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and when we go into executive session, uh, we're going to have an overview on uh, the collective bargaining negotiations, um, which everybody is a part of, um, if you choose to be. It's not a uh, it's not a standing subcommittee. The the training and labor management committee subcommittees are actually delineated in the collective bargaining agreement. So those are standing subcommittees that have to meet on a regular basis, whereas the CBA negotiations are obviously dependent on when the contract comes up for renewal. So. So David, there's no getting off that, correct? <laughs> <laughs> Especially not for you. <laughs> Thank you. I just thought maybe I'd mention that. Well, we can talk offline, Denise. Really. Yeah. 
there is one way you could take the way I'm doing, which is to retire oh, no. next year. So, oh, I, oh, sure. If you'd like to take me on in your retirement, I'll gladly leave with you. <laughs> yes, Melissa asked if she could retire with me too, and you know, it would being well, I won't say Melissa's age, but it's <laughs> under fifty, so. She would have very, very, very early retirement. Yeah. Special category. So. <laughs> um, I think uh, everybody should also have the schedule for next year's meetings uh, that Melissa had sent around. And uh, the, the council meets every quarter. So we're proposing January 11th, April 12th, July 12th, and October 11th, all Tuesdays from 9.30 to 11.30. Um, obviously subject to change if things come up, but uh, we do need a formal vote on it, and then we have to notify the Secretary of State since we are a statutory body. Um, so. This is Ken. This is Kathy. Can I ask one question? Are any of those dates the Tuesday after a Monday holiday? Is that a trick? Uh, question? The 11th, no, it's, not, it's literally not a trick question. It's just because this meeting today kind of messed up some stuff for me at work. Um, uh, and a Tuesday after a Monday holiday is a bit of a problem. But, you know, I think if we can avoid that. That would be great. I'll have to I'll have to look because the eleventh might be. Yeah, I Absolutely. think Martin Luther King's birthday is the is the week after that. Um, right, that's the seventeenth. Is yeah. Martin Luther King? So. so for me, Melissa, the second Tuesday of every month, I'm a part of a utilization review committee for the department. I when I can get coverage, it's fine. It's not a big deal. This morning I presented early, so I was able to join. But those days are specific, the Tuesday, nine o'clock till one o'clock, the first, second Tuesday of every month. So as long as I have the schedule in advance and I can get coverage, I'm fine. But I just kind of wanted to note that Tuesdays, oh, specifically that Tuesday are tough for me. Um, the October 11th date is the day following uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. So yeah. next year as well. So, yeah. And if we stay second Tuesday, that'll be the case every single year because the first Monday every, I mean, the second Monday every October is, is that day. So we would have that problem annually. So, um, third um, Tuesday. Could we switch to third Tuesday? Because Denise, that would solve your problem and should avoid the holidays. Of course, that could create another problem, but. <laughs> I'm going to have a conflict on the third Tuesday. Do I hear the fourth Tuesday? <laughs> I'll go with the fourth Tuesday. Mm -hmm. That's good. Sorry, Melissa. No, no, I don't. I don't care. I'm just making sure we always have four Tuesdays. Do you have a fourth Tuesday in every? So one, I, uh, I don't think that's a problem for me. David doesn't care because he only has to do it one more time. Um, so who's taking over for David after? Like, will you be running the helm, Melissa? I'm, I'm taking over all of it. Um, oh. I'm just running OPM now, so I'm no. so sorry. No, <laughs> no. Did the new secretary? <laughs> no, no, no. I don't. I really don't know. And David's leaving very, very big shoes to fill. So I'm yeah. not sure how it's all, how it's all going to shake out. Wow. It is that <clears throat> that's yet to be decided. Okay. Um, but it's actually appointed by the governor, so it's, um, it's not as simple as. If it was up to me, I'd just ask Melissa to do it, but it's not um, yeah. that straightforward. I'm sure she's happy if you don't ask her, just ask her to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think she needs a little bit I'm, more encouragement than just do me a favor, Melissa. <laughs> no, in, in all honesty, I'm happy to do whatever, you know, whatever needs to be done. 
So, and this is a good group and I think it's kind of exciting now that we have new yeah. membership and new blood and you know, we're, we're about to start a new contract. So we're, we're in a really good, we're in a good spot now. We are, I agree. So, we made it through 2020, so. So, so we can um, try and have a vote. So the yeah. fourth Tuesday would be January 26th. Uh, April 27th, July 27th, and whoops, sorry. I think you mean January 25th. I think you were looking yeah. at Tuesday. So. Yeah, I got the wrong year. Sorry. January 25th. April 26th, July 26th, and then October 25th. So if everybody's comfortable with that, we can vote on that and then recirculate a new schedule for folks. Do you need a motion? If so, yeah. we make it. Kathy second. made a motion. Adam seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Okay, the schedule is adopted. Hey, Carrie. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody. I'll get a new schedule out. Uh, David, just for everybody's benefit, I don't know if everybody knows uh, Carrie Fillick. Can I just do a Yep. Quick hit. Yeah, so uh, Carrie Phillick also mm -hmm. works at DSS, not DDS, which is actually, that's what I almost said. I work for the Department of Development. I, <laughs> Dawn, I watched you stutter. I'm like, so she's going to say DDS. Like, Wait a minute. I had department like uh, <laughs> confusion for a second. Uh, it feels like I do sometimes, actually. But uh, DSS, and uh, she's uh, she manages the chess program and CFC program for us. So uh, she, she's, she's, she's the wingman. Yay. <laughs> Good morning. Hi. So let's move on uh, to more meatier subjects than the schedule. And I'm glad we got through that. It's probably the hardest thing we'll do today. So uh, Dawn and Denise, if you guys could give us your department updates on, on PPE. Denise, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, just so folks are aware, um, since the, I won't say exactly the start of the pandemic because we were just kind of operationalizing things, but pretty close to the start of the pandemic, um, DDS engaged in um, protective personal equipment for um, individuals and families that self-direct as well as our qualified provider agencies. Um, currently, we are doing two different types of um, request and distribution of PPE. For folks who need um, more specialized PPE kits, those would be for individuals who might have respiratory um, complications, um, are asymptomatic or symptomatic with COVID. They would request online through an online process um, a specific number of kits based on the number of staff that they have in terms of self-directed supports. So they would request specialty kits online and they would pick them up at one of the four DDS locations. So our in-person um, PPE sites are four sites on every Wednesday between nine and one. Um, we rotate from Norwich DDS office, um, the Southbury Training School office, um, Ella Grasso Regional Center, which is down in Stratford and the East Hartford office. So every Wednesday, folks will go there and pick up their specialty kits that they requested online or just show up and request the regular kits. So the difference between the regular kits and the specialty kits basically um, are the specialty kits have a um, facial shield as well as a gown. So it's more of like a I won't say a hospital grade, but it's additional protections where the regular kits will just have the gloves and the masks. So those specialty kits have those two extra pieces. 
right now we are averaging, so I do the data every month for DDS and each kit will have 20 masks and 50 pairs of gloves. I finally got the numbers right. They're a box of 100. However, you need to have two to make a pair. So our data now reflects that. Um, we collect this data and present it to SEIU 1199 um, <clears throat> every month. So right now we're looking at about, some of the locations are, are a little bit more geographically um, centralized. So we'll notice that more of the employers of record or their designated employees, it could be their staff or a case manager could actually go and pick up that stuff. Um, the office in Stratford averages between 50 and 60 employers of record on their given Wednesday. The other locations, um, East Hartford is the next one, usually between 25 and 35, uh, given the month. Um, and the other two, Norwich and St Southbury, because they're so, you know, um, isolated really in terms of um, their geographic location, they're usually a lower number. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of like the, the update of, of what we're doing in terms of PPE. The only thing that's going to change coming forward um, is that in the winter months, we move the start times of PPE to 10 o'clock. And I will let folks know, but our, we have a flyer that's updated regularly on our DDS website. It's under individual and families, COVID resources, and then there's a flyer that's posted there, as well as the link in Spanish and in English for people to request their specialty PPE. And then, if God forbid, there is a um, an emergent need for PPE and people can't wait for that Wednesday, they can work through their case manager and the case manager will coordinate with me or the, one of the other two um self-determination directors to try and get that PPE picked up and dropped off or coordinated for the family or staff to pick up. Hopefully mm -hmm. it was thorough enough, gave you a good overview. Yeah. Um, but uh, also one thing I noticed is that during the summertime, the, okay, the numbers dropped in the summer, summer and now they started picking up again um, um, during the September months, we're having more people, it looks like a little bit more people are requesting online. Okay, well, thanks, Denise. Anybody have any questions for Denise? Okay, Dawn, you wanna give us a DSS update? Sure, so Carrie's going to show the dashboard, uh, the PPE dashboard. Um, so this is, uh, so we update this and I uh, may have accidentally sent the one from September. That's, uh, that's on me, but it hasn't, it doesn't change that much um, these days. So um, basically, let me move this screen. OK, so we've been tracking from the very, very beginning. You get an idea on the very first one where we are on the very first chart. We do use the Kennedy Center. We set up the distribution center. Oh, probably by um, late April of um, 2020. And that distribution center um, is located. We entered into a contract through executive order with the Kennedy Center and they have been uh, distributing PPE. Our process at DSS, um, we have a web-based form like DDS's form. People still request PPE every single day. We also prospectively um, send PPE to all, um, all new employers and all new employees every single week. So any new employee that just started or any new employer has a supply of PPE um, as they start to self-direct and as they, as they start to have workers come into their home. PPE is delivered directly to the employees if they're new employees in that startup, what we call a startup kit, and then directly to employers. So here you just see the massive amount of PPE that's been distributed. Um, you can see it's millions and millions of, uh, of pieces of equipment have been delivered to our members to keep them safe and to provide them with the uh, support that they need to be safe during that during the pandemic. Um, the dark blue is the face masks. We have face masks all the way from um, paper uh, disposable uh, procedure masks to um, to KN95s to N95 masks. We also 
have done some uh, fit testing so that people can properly use N95s. Um, the gloves, then you can see next to that, we haven't, we've had a shortage of gloves since the beginning of the pandemic. So that's the reason why the number of gloves um, is so low. We actually haven't been mass um, distributing gloves that, as we have been mass where they're not in short supply, at least as of um, today. And then for people who are using aerosolizing procedures at home, um, who are or otherwise um, in a, 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 a category where um, more protective equipment is appropriate, um, those individuals receive gowns, face shields, um, and a, a, a different level of equipment. And so that's what you see, the gowns, the face shields uh, going across. We were distributing cloth, cloth masks every quarter um it, it directly to so that everybody would have an additional supply to ev everyone thousands and thousands millions and millions as you can see on the turquoise we don't do that anymore we um that the uh, workers and the employers actually suggested that they'd like the procedure masks the disposable masks a little bit more so we distribute all disposable masks now for folks to use um that's pretty much if uh, if you want to go. We also, if somebody is um, is COVID positive or suspected of COVID positive, we do same day delivery. So when that comes in, we we um, a driver at Kennedy Center delivers the equipment as long as we have the request by um, I believe it's noon each day. We um, personally deliver the equipment so that it doesn't put anybody at risk. Immediate turnaround. So that's our that's our update on PPE. We still get requests every single day. Um, and uh, we're still pushing out equipment every single day. You can see across the bottom, Terry, if you want to adjust, or is it my screen? Yeah, so this is the weekly flow. You can see all the way from the beginning, the pandemic, what, how the numbers. Now, the big peaks, that's where we actually are sending equipment uh, it, prospectively. That's not requested equipment. That's us pushing out equipment so that there isn't an emergency. So those are the big peaks that, that you see on the chart. You can see it slowed down a little bit over the last four weeks because we um, did have some trouble getting some inventory. So we were filling the demand requests, but we weren't filling the, um, we weren't prospectively shipping out um, thousands of masks to people. We do have inventory now, so we're doing that again. But that's if you just can see over the, the course of the pandemic, you can see where our, our, our peaks were in, uh, in delivery. So, David, back to you if there are no questions. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks, Dawn. Thanks, Carrie. Does anybody have any questions for Dawn? Okay. <clears throat> so, most of you are probably aware there's been several iter iterations of federal paid leave uh, during the pandemic. The most recent was through the American Rescue Plan that extended the leave, but also expanded the eligibility for the paid leave. Uh, that leave expired on September 30th uh, and was not renewed by Congress. So currently there is no federal paid leave program in place. Uh, you're also probably aware there is a state paid leave program where benefits will go into effect uh, January 1st, 2022, that people have been paying one half of 1% of their salaries into uh, during 2021, uh, but that is not a pandemic specific uh, benefit leave as the federal one was that was directly tied to COVID. Uh, and the state paid leave program is not like your traditional uh, sick leave program. Um, it's a pretty comprehensive and expansive program, um, but it's not really designed for someone just calling out a day here or a day there um, for being sick. Uh, there's a formal process and so on. It's really more designed for more extended leaves. So we do, we do certainly have a gap uh, when it comes to PCAs because there is no paid leave in our current collective bargaining agreement. So, um, Melissa, if you want to just give us an update on where the, the numbers stand, uh, applications can still be submitted for leave that was taken up through uh, 
September 30th, but any leave that was beyond September 30th will be denied by the, the FIs. Thanks, David. Um, so to just give you uh, a quick overview, uh, what our final data looks like, and this is pretty close to final, because as David said, the program hasn't been renewed past September 30th, uh, but people can still be submitting applications for leave that was taken in the last week of September. So we, we only expect a, a handful of additional applications to come in. Uh, so we will be doing a final reconciliation of federal paid leave numbers uh, once we get to the end of October. But for right now, uh, this is where we stand uh, as of last Friday. We had a total of 300 application uh, sick applications uh, for paid sick leave for DDS and 507 for PCAs working for DSS consumers. So in total, um, over the course of the uh, federal paid leave programs that were offered, the FIs uh, handled 807 paid sick leave applications. For um, expanded family medical leave, we saw 18 um, approved applications for PCAs working for individuals who are served by DDS programs and 75 applications for PCAs that work for individuals served by DSS uh, with a total of 93 EFMLA requests approved. Uh, we did have 155 applications that were submitted and ended up being denied for various reasons. Um, most frequent reason was that it didn't meet the, it didn't meet one of the uh, COVID related uh, eligibility criteria for the paid leave. And then we had individuals who once they realized they weren't eligible, uh, withdrew their applications on their own. So uh, we are, I'm still in the process of doing a little bit of reconciliation uh, with the FIs. I had started a breakdown of how many applications were processed by each fiscal intermediary so that it would total back to these grant totals. Um, there are just, it seems that over the course of the last week, one of the FIs um, made a bunch of updates to their their spreadsheet so the numbers were just a little funky but they're fixing that for us right now so uh that is where we landed so the fis really did a great amount of work this was obviously a benefit that that folks needed and it was you know taken advantage of uh you know by over 800 individuals in the state and when the final report is done and reconciled, I will send everybody the final cumulative report as well as the individual F, uh, breakdown by fiscal intermediary so you can see how many applications were handled by each FI as well. Any questions? Okay, thanks a lot, Melissa. Appreciate it. So our next agenda item has to deal with outreach to employers. Um, and I'll, I'll turn this over to Melissa, but uh, we used to have a forum for consumers. And obviously last year we did not have it because of COVID and we didn't have it this year because of COVID. Um, but it has been the, the council's way of reaching out to employers. Um, sometimes what happens on this council, as you'll learn, is uh, the, the conversation gets dominated about PCA needs um, as opposed to consumer employers. <clears throat> and that's why it's so great that we have the new members on the council and greater representation around consumer employers because 
the council's really main role is to represent consumer employers. The union represents PCAs, um, but it, the, the PCAs obviously far outnumber us. And when we talk about the CBA negotiations, we'll, we'll touch on that. Um, and I, I think personally, the consumer employer's voice uh, gets lost oftentimes. And, and there is no body except for this council, which obviously is pretty small, representing them as the PCAs have with, with the union. So we've used the consumer forum uh, to communicate with the employers and have various presentations and really as a way to, to connect with them. And so, uh, so Melissa, maybe you want to kick us off. We just wanted to have a general discussion for a few minutes about possible options to uh, continue that conversation with with consumer employers, which we've tried to do through communication through the FIs, um, but that's that's also limited um, as well. So, so Melissa, great. So. Actually, David said most of what I was going to say. So uh, we, you know, <laughs> what I, <laughs> so really what I wanted to open up to the group was given that uh, in looking at our statutory authority and what we are supposed to be doing as a council, David is correct that we are supposed to be representing both state agencies and consumer employers at the collective bargaining table. But also in statute, we're supposed to be educating consumer employers. And a big part of representing consumer employers in bargaining and, and educating them is that, you know, we can reach out to them and, and engage with them and get feedback. And um, not so sure that many consumer employers know the council exists, what it does, um, how they can engage with us to provide their feedback. And because we haven't had the forum in, in a couple of years, uh, I wanted to see what folks were thinking could be ways that we could engage effectively with consumer employers. We've, we've had our, you know, council corner in the FI newsletters. Um, we have tried doing outreach um, through constant contact and other group sourcing contacts, but uh, we get a lot of bounce backs or people getting angry because they don't know why constant, they don't know who we are. And so they're getting something from constant contact. Um, so just trying to think creatively, I don't want to let two years go by where we haven't touched base at all with consumer employers, especially when we're in the middle of bargaining. And we're in a catch-22 because we can't share any details about bargaining whatsoever with anybody outside of the council. That's completely um, confidential. So, but we can engage with them to see what topics are, are you know, tell them who we are, what we do, find out what are, what matters of being a consumer employer are pressing for them. Uh, but I'm really looking for thoughts from all of you about A, do we want to seek to engage our consumer employers more? And B, how would we do that? Um, typically, we would go through the fiscal intermediaries, but I'm concerned with the amount of work that the fiscal intermediaries have on their plate and the amount of communication we're already sending to consumer employers through the FIs. Um, that is pressing, such as the transition to EVV, um, electronic visit verification, and, and other such things. I don't, I don't want them to start getting so much communication from Allied and Sunset Shores that they start ignoring really important notifications that they have to take action on. So just opening it up for discussion to see if anybody has thoughts on what we could do to, to reach our consumer employers. So, Melissa, this is Peg. What have you found was most effective in the past? Well, Peg, we haven't really done. This is a place we have not done much. We, oh, okay. we haven't. 
we the only thing that we have done to reach out to consumer employers is um, we've done the employer forum and then every time there's a new collective bargaining agreement we do a summary every time there's only two so this is our third version but we've done um a summary of all the changes, all the new key points in the collective bargaining agreement, and we've had the FIs, the fiscal intermediaries, send that out to all of the consumer employers. And any other communication that we've had that we need to get to consumer employers, we have sent through the fiscal intermediaries. Something that um, might work is something that's easy because People are inundated with information from all of the different services that are represented here. And it may be a simple postcard um, where in your corner, something, a simple message to go out to them, let them know you're here. And then perhaps a series of surveys like a survey monkey, but simple, um, no more than say five questions uh, at a time so that you can gather information from them. Um, but I, I, I guess at the heart, I would say definitely reach out and keep it simple. Thanks. And then I guess I'd be looking at the state agencies as to what the most effective way is to reach out. Um, I mean, part of our problem is we have zero budget. Um, so, <laughs> doing mailings and things of that nature get tricky. Um, but, you know, the FIs hold the consumer employer less, the agencies hold the consumer employer less. So not sure, uh, Dawn and Denise, if you have thoughts on the most effective ways to reach this population, I know it's, it's tricky. Yeah. I think my question is, what do other councils do? I mean, that's one question that I would have just in terms of, but, it, but in terms of the easiest way, I mean, operationally, I mean, we do push things out through the FI or we push things out through the department. Um, I, my concern is operationally we're stretched too. So I, I don't know that we can take on things. We can certainly get a list, but um, to, to you guys, but um, I'm, I'm not sure that right now. I think I'd need to know more to know whether or not we could actually commit to doing to doing more than that. But a list that it would be certainly we could get a list. OK. Yeah. yeah, so there's really only one other council that's very similar to us and they have a staff and a budget like they're an actual funded. Yeah. Formal entity. Um, so that puts us in a slightly different position, but we're just trying to think creatively. And I think even if we had the list of employers, which we do, that's what we have done in the past for the, when we do the employer forum, we get the list of consumer employers from the FIs, and then we take over the outreach so that the invitations and everything didn't have to go out through the FIs. We could manage the enrollments and the questions and all of that and not burden the FIs with that. So even if we could get the list, that might be something we could, I could explore on our end, how we push out a communication. Um, we could perhaps do one just initially before Christmas time to just reintroduce ourselves to everybody. We can discuss what we would want to include, but that would set us up so that when we send our, once we have a, collective bargaining agreement, hopefully after the new year. When we send the summary, we're not coming at a whole group of people who've never heard of us before and they they know who we are and that they can trust the information that's in the summary, because I'm hoping now they've seen our council corner during COVID. They got um, communication from us. So now if we can do one more introductory communication and then our CBA summary, that might be that might be um, a couple good immediate steps we can take if we have the employer list. And then if folks have questions on what would be in that messaging, that communication we send in lieu of 
our employer form, I'd be open to it. We can certainly share our website. We could put information that we would have had at a forum up on a web page and create almost like a virtual um, consumer employer form where people can go and get the information. Um, we could get creative. It's just a matter of how to direct people to the right place. Yeah, Melissa, I think those are great suggestions. Um, in terms of DDS and what we find has been the most effective um, is going, you know, issuing our communications through um, either formal or informally through our case managers. But unfortunately, they just, again, don't have the capacity to be able to take right. anything additional on. Um, but yeah, that one-to-one -one outreach has always been the best uh, method of informing folks. I mean, we've definitely beefed up our DDS website through this pandemic. That's one thing that we've learned that, you know, you want to make things easily accessible to people. Um, you know, so making sure that folks are aware, one, that there are resources available someplace and then give them a simple link for folks to go to. Electronic emails. I think most of the FIs at this point should have email addresses because of EVV, should have email addresses to all EORs. So rather than sending things through the mail that might take a couple of weeks for them to get, we could do a double blast doing electronic contact as well as through the mail. That always is helpful. Another place that folks get information through our department is our DDS Facebook page through our social media. We post our recreation calendars there. We talk about healthy relationship resources. So we do that as well. I could always issue and ask our web um, developer to post some of that stuff on our, our sites as well, our social media as well as our DDS page. That's very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I I would also suggest that getting that information out to the independent living centers where they mm -hmm. could post it on their Facebook pages um, and other resources um, with a, a link that goes to somewhere else, but at least it's getting the word out. Great, thank you. <clears throat> what do people think about the thought of putting together something on our web page that's almost like a virtual consumer employer forum um, where you know we could even ask the FIs to make little short two second videos. You know, Laura Wells has done that before, um, just introducing themselves and we just have a link up to it, um, you know, and about our members uh, have a consumer employer speak. You know, I'm sure Mary would make a, or Sheila, somebody would make a quick video about what the council is or has done for them as an employer that we could just post up there and it can live there so people can go forever, but we could do a little bit of a push to get the word out. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, I like the idea of having that um, that one spot that people can go to because we're constantly getting new folks self-directing services. And we say, oh, we've already done that. We've sent out this, we've done this big push. Now what happens to the employer who started tomorrow? They, they, they're yeah. missing out on that information. So yeah, I think that's great, Melissa. Okay, I'm happy to get. Um, yeah, Kathy, do you have a comment? I'm sorry, I'm just now seeing yes, your hand. Yes, um, I only just raised it. I mean, oh. I'm wondering the same way that we do orientation for the PCAs. Should we think about, of course, with no budget? I don't know how you do this, but developing some kind of orientation for consumer employers, where you know maybe you have short videos of people who've been. Um, acting as consumer employers for a number of years. Like I'm thinking, uh, you know, Mary and her kids talking about what it's like to be the, you know, to be the consumer employer or the employer of record. Um, and it, I just wonder if there might be people, and I hate even saying this because it's just like, how much more are we gonna ask people to put on their plates? But whether there might be um, people who've, been in the program for a long time who are willing to serve as peer mentors to people who are coming into it. 
Yeah, Kathy, those are those are great suggestions. You know, I just thought of this, um, and I don't know maybe if Dawn and I want to take this offline, but we just contracted that our department contracted with PPL Public Partnerships um, LLC. They developed a um, training curriculum for our new employers of record, as well as enhanced training for folks who have been um, employers of record for a while, but might need just a little more refresher on certain things. So there's different sessions and curriculums that they can sign up for. I'm wondering if Dawn and I could just do, or if Melissa, do a quick, hey, this is the PCA Workforce Council, because it's going to hit all brand new employers. It's the new requirement for anyone who self-directs through our department, mm -hmm. if they're going to use Medicaid funding, is to go through this training. So we can just put maybe a quick slide with the links so that folks become aware of who the PCA Workforce Council is and what our role is. And if there's anything specific to DSS, on that you wanted to add to that saying, you know, this is a DDS specific EOR training. However, if you also utilize CFC, <laughs> here's some information you might need to know. Yeah, I think that it might make sense um, to the degree the council is comfortable with it. I mean, some there's an intersect to Denise's point with operationally the responsibilities of the department to empower and train employers. That's that's what we do because that's what the program is. So it might make sense to have coordination where there there is a piece of the council that is somehow or other integrated into the existing activities or the planned activities of the department. So I, I don't I'm saying that out loud. I have no idea what that looks like. Um, but but that's that, that uh, op to me, some of what you're talking about is an operational function, which is why you know DDS has a, a stand up contract and why DSS has some things going on in that area as well. It might make sense to do that just to, to try to influence that existing stream somehow and insert um, the role of the council. I think it is important for employers to understand that there is a collective bargaining process to understand what collective bargaining is and what it does for them or you know what their role is in that. And I, I frankly don't know how much of a role the you know this this body. I mean, all of you who are new members here today are representing. You're you're, you're representing the voice of the employers at the table with respect to negotiating wages. I mean, that at, at a very pure, very simplistic level, that's like the primary role of of what's going on here. And then secondary to that is the training that. Melissa mentioned, but it, uh, and the education. I'm not clear on the statute though about what the role is with respect to education. Educate about the, educate about the council, or educate. It, is it broader than that? And this is not necessarily a discussion for today, but I'm not. I'm just not clear on that. But that maybe that in that part, maybe that's the intersect with the educational requirements that the departments have. I, I don't know enough about it to know whether or not that's that's a good place to kind of. Uh, connect. But they certainly should know, employers cer cer certainly should know why the wages of their employees are going up. And they should know that they may be going up, or they certainly have been going up, and they may not understand why. So that that's a good place to talk about what the role of the council is. That's kind of like the why, right? Because it's collective bargaining. Um, <clears throat> yep, I, I agree. Yeah, and Dawn, I, I think the role is to, uh, is to educate beyond just what the council is. Mm -hmm. I think it's to educate about what self-direction is and helping to empower them. So I, I do think that there's a lot of intersect there. That would be the intersect and if it's broader, exactly, David. And so how we do that, you know, I don't, I don't know, but there is funding to do that because the programs are funded to do that. So so there's an opportunity. That's all I'm saying. That That's my point is that there's an opportunity, but it would be coordinated. So we went from no budget to having a budget. I'm glad yeah. we talked. So Adam, you had your hand up? Yeah, I, um, I, I, one of so the independent living center that I worked for in New York was also an FI for our consumer directed program, and one of the things that 
uh, the folks in that who who worked that program did um, that. I believe it was a value add. I don't think it was a part of our reimbursement, but we we considered it a mission as an IL um, was to use to to do sort of some hands on training of how to be a how to be a, a an employer for uh, for the consumers. Um, and I'm wondering whether the we're aware that the FIs do much of that. Is there a way that we can sort of piggyback off of training that they're doing? Um, and that, that's more, more a question, but but if, if the FIs are doing some degree of formal training, um, is, that, is that an opportunity for us to, to at least get the word out? Hmm. I mean, Denise and Don can speak more to this than me. I, I I know they put together a manual. I'm not sure that they do actual training. Is that accurate? Yeah. So we're and we're in a weird place right now uh, because you know we're. I, I think most folks know um, we're um, soon going to be releasing a releasing an RFP. And you know the contents of that RFP, which will be very public soon, um, I think speak to some of the things that are here that the departments uh, are looking to do a little bit differently. So let me just leave it at that. I think it just goes back to David's point. There will be opportunities, but at this exact moment, I don't know that it's great timing for DSS to do um, just because of where we are in transition and other activities. Probably not something we're taking on at this exact moment. Um, yeah, and I'm going to second what Don is saying. Besides this very strange transition time, um, and with the introduction of EVV electronic visit verification requirements, they're kind of inundated with all of that stuff at the moment. And when it comes to the the FI role, I mean, their role really is, um, you know, like a, a payroll division. They really shouldn't be involved in trainings and stuff like that. Um, we had to really. That's why DDS made the decision to move forward contract with a um, education training agency because we want to take that shift a bit from the FI as well as for from case managers as well. I mean, they shouldn't have to train an employer of record. Um, that's really not their function. So, but that's that's a good point, Adam. So our you know our at least our self directed services in Connecticut run a little bit different in terms of what the established role of the FI would be. Okay, I'm just gonna. I'm just going to really quick share my screen here so you guys can see the statue. I tried to share the link, but it came through funny in chat. So um, let me just see if I can uh, see. There you go. Are you all seeing this the highlighted in blue? Mm -hmm. So this is our charge statutorily. Um, and when it comes to education, so workforce development and retention, as well as collective bargaining, are our main our main charges. And then uh, developing training, it would be under B, developing training and educational opportunities for personal care attendants and consumers. So we're meeting our personal care attendant training through our contract with the 1199 training and upgrading fund and through collective bargaining with 1199. Um, what we haven't done is de develop, you know, consistently. We have done it. It's not that we're not in compliance, but how can we do a better job at providing educational opportunities, training and educational opportunities for our consumers? So it's very broad to get to Don's point. Yeah, and I, I would say, Melissa, you know, there's there's ample opportunities for us to to work with the agencies and have some intersect there. And you know, as Don and Denise said, some of this will get fleshed out once once the whole FI RFP process. So, yeah, All so right, so we there, kicked off a good discussion at least. Yeah, I think I think there were some great suggestions and um, 
I think if people think of other opportunities, if you can share them with Melissa and I after the meeting, that would be great. Um, I think we'd Maybe, like to move. Sorry. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, and Denise and I can talk about it more to figure out. What, like, so as we already said, I think that there are ways to integrate. So I don't want the, the council members to be thinking, well, you know, this is some sort of a dead end. I don't think it is. I just think that we need to figure it out um, and then and then answer the question of how can the, the council have a, a role or what could the role of the council be relative to some of the existing funding streams that are also designated for the same purpose? That's really the question. So um, and and Melissa, just so the council knows there there is funding for training, but that's specific for the employee training, right? Is that correct or is that not? Yeah, that's so, correct. So there's been a budget that's been appropriated, but the funding that was appropriated was for the employees to receive training, which is also good for employers. It's not bad that employees have training money, but I'm going to guess that most employers don't know that. That might be a great point of education. They, you know, do employers even know what access their employees have? They should, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm not so sure they do. So, um, so anyway, we can work on it. Great. Well, thanks. Um, I think we want to move on because uh, we do have a couple of special guests that have joined us. Uh, Tom Austin and Kristen Pepin from the Office of Labor Relations within OPM, who are our chief negotiators uh, for our CBA negotiations. So uh, before we go into executive session, is, are there any other items folks wanted to bring up? In regular session. OK, and there's nobody from the public, so there's no public comment. So I believe, Melissa, I need a motion to adjourn the regular session. Motion uh, to adjourn. Motion, motion to enter executive session. Yep, that's what we need. Okay. So Dawn. Dawn has a motion to enter executive session. Is there a second? Second. Adam, second. Okay. So uh, we need to stop the recording, Melissa, correct? Yep. Just wait.